Muy buenas tardes, buenas noches en, en Latinoamérica. Estamos en este momento cerrando nuestro ciclo de conversaciones de filosofía japonesa y vamos a cerrarlo con una exposición que nos va a permitir entrar un poquito, mirar un poquito, vislumbrar eh, la filosofía japonesa del periodo Edo. Eh, en todo caso, no va a ser una, no necesariamente una exposición súper comprensiva, de hecho, eh, ya, ya eh, nuestra experta va a comentarnos mejor cómo va a enfocar el, el, el tema. En todo caso, bueno, precisamente para, para entrar por ahí, eh, antes que nada, recordarles que esta charla se va a dar en inglés, pero ustedes van a poder hacer sus preguntas a través del chat de YouTube en inglés o en español, cualquiera de las dos lenguas, la que ustedes prefieran, en la que se sientan mejor. Eh, no va a haber problema con eso. So you can choose a language, you can ask in Spanish, you can ask in English, eh, whatever you prefer, whatever language you feel most comfortable with. Um, nuestra conferencista de hoy es eh, rumana, que actualmente vive en Japón, Alexandra Mustatea. Espero haber pronunciado bien. Eh, ella es profesora actualmente en la Kanda University of International Studies en Japón, donde precisamente eh, enseña sobre religiones de Japón y eh, historia premoderna japonesa. Y a su vez también es una entusiasta de la fotografía, cosa muy importante en nuestros tiempos. Y bueno, ten, he tenido la oportunidad de conversar con ella en los últimos dos años, creo, especialmente, y ha sido siempre muy enriquecedor. Eh, hoy pues tengo la fortuna precisamente de moderar esta conferencia de cierre. Entonces, a partir de ahora, vamos a ya a movernos a, al inglés. Eh, en algunos casos en los que quizás sí haya necesidad de traducir preguntas o algo así, yo me ocuparé un poco de manejar eso. En todo caso, como les digo, pueden escoger el idioma en el que hagan sus preguntas, que igual nosotros las abordaremos después de la charla. Eh, so Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, hi. So, um, like Carlos said, my name is Alex uh, Mustaza. Um, I have a very... Um, strange, very difficult to pronounce name. Uh, this is my uh, biggest problem in Japan. Um, nobody um, quite gets it. Um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about Edo philosophy, but because this is such a broad uh, topic, I decided to focus uh, more on my field of uh, expertise on Japanese Confucian philosophers and the world they envisioned. And I chose Confucianism not just because it's my um, my more comfortable area, but also because uh, we don't talk so much about it. When we meet and talk about philosophy and the influence of uh, one tradition or another, um, Edo period tradition or another on modern philosophy, Confucian philosophers are kind of left outside of that conversation. And I'm going to explain a little bit why that is the case and why I feel that is um, a mistake because um, Confucian philosophers of the Edo period, um, especially the ones I talk about today, um, have a lot to offer to um, the, the intercultural philosophy. Um, we still have a lot to learn from them and um, maybe um, their ideas can help us maybe find a, envision a better world for ourselves. So um, to give you a very brief overview of the presentation, um, Of course, I'm going to start with a self-introduction, uh, mainly because it's connected to the topic of um, today's talk. Um, and I'm going to split my presentation in two. In one, I'm going to take, I'm going to put my um, intellectual historian shoes on, and I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, why, uh, what is the trouble with Japanese Confucianism about that modern uh, problem that we have with Confucianism and its relevance for contemporary intercultural philosophy. Uh, and I'm going to give you a very brief history of Confucianism, especially in, um, in Edo, Japan. 
And in the second part, the last part, uh, hopefully for not more than uh, 20, 30 minutes, uh, I'm going to take uh, a philosophical perspective. I'm going to try and describe the Confucian universe by focusing on um, one um, philosopher in particular, Yamaga Soko, um, who is quite uh, famous and a bit controversial, uh, but I'm again going to explain that a little later. Um, and I want to focus on the idea of personhood and uh, what role knowledge plays in um, being human and um, how we can achieve moral discernment. Uh, because this um, this is the part which I feel is most relevant to contemporary debates, um, intercultural debates, um, kind of negotiating the idea of individualism, for example, uh, trying to learn and um, find new ways of talk of thinking about persons in the world. So, starting with my self introduction, I started working on Confucianism. Uh, I want to say 13 years ago, 14 years ago, uh, because I had no other option at the time in Romania. Uh, nobody was doing PhDs, uh, nobody was conducting PhDs. So I had to work with, uh, with a colleague, with a, a teacher from the, the Chinese department. And that turned out to be my destiny in a sense, because um, I never really uh, moved away from, um, from Confucianism uh, in the Edo period. And I'm most interested in how Confucianism um, played a part in both the end of the what we know sometimes as the feudal period um, in Japan and how it influenced, influenced discourses of modernity, how it became a controversial and a, a highly <laughs> a hot topic even today. Um, so generally when we talk about Bushido, Kokutai, uh, nationalistic discourses of the Meiji period, the late Meiji period, um, we have to talk about Confucianism. Um, and among, um, among all Confucian's, Confucian authors, um, I generally focus on Yamaga Soko because he is also called the father of modern Bushido uh, by some uh, researchers. And at the moment, I'm again doing something uh, related to Confucianism, but this time um, I focus less on uh, the philosophy, but more on uh, archival <laughs> research. I'm, I'm putting my historian shoes uh, on a lot these days because I've um, started looking for uh, female Confucian scholars. This is a topic that never ever appears in um, intellectual histories of Confucianism or philosophies uh, related um, of Confucianism. So um, at the moment I'm discovering such a wealth of uh, resources that tell us a different story about Confucianism in Edo Japan. Uh, when we think about Confucianism, we generally think um, a philosophy that uh, relegated women to being inside the house, not really having freedom to become social actors, for example, um, or political actors. Um, however, if we delve into um, archives, we see that, especially in, uh, if you see here in, in, the, in the Edo uh, area, towards the end of the Edo period, there were a lot of female Confucian scholars that drew up to like 600 people uh, every day for their uh, lectures. So uh, this is a completely new world for me and this is what I do at the moment. And um, hopefully it will add to uh, our following discussion as well. So um, starting with um, Neo-Confucianism and Edo philosophy um, and the trouble, um, the, what I was saying earlier about the trouble with Confucianism uh, today. Um, the, main, the main problem that remains is because Confucianism was, Confucianism offered the moral vocabulary for the Meiji political leaders to construct a new uh, national identity, um, we are left nowadays, especially because of that connection that happened with milita uh, militarism in the 1930s, uh, before World War II, um, and the Kokutai ideology, um, we, we are left nowadays 
um, and um, more so in the post-war period, in the immediate post-war period, with um, thinking that Confucianism should not really be talked about as a philosophy, maybe as an ideology, maybe like um, an, a morality, but something very simplistic and actually very uh, bad for society, for a modern progressive society. Um, but like I said many times, um, for anybody who has ever uh, heard me speaking, I say this again and again, um, because I think we need to remember it. Confucian, uh, Confucian, uh, the Confucian vocabulary actually just served a purpose. Um, it, it was just an instrument. It was uh, broken down, defragmented. And what we know uh, as Confucian morality in modern Japan is actually just sounding Confucian. Um, and this is what I hope I will also uh, manage to show today. Um, and we can talk about that a little more um, later. But if I'm to look for culprits or um, if we as a community of intellectual historians are to look for culprits for this state of affairs, um, I think we have to look at Inoue Tetsujiro, who was um, an incredible, uh, incredibly talented um, philosopher and intellectual historian uh, who actually brought Confucianism into the attention of the modern world, uh, as it were. He introduced Confucianism, uh, all, all um, what he uh, categorized as the three main schools of uh, Confucianism. Um, but also later on, um, he spent a lot of effort uh, in creating um, an ideology basically to support a nationalistic discourse. So because of that particular connection that he had, because he made that shift in his career and he became uh, a symbol of ultra-nationalist ideologies in Japan, um, Confucianism kind of got caught in the middle. So it was no longer credible as a philosophy uh, in and of its own. But this itself is a, is a topic for an entire, uh, new, entirely new uh, debate. So please allow me to um, skip the details. Um, if I'm to talk about what I find relevant for intercultural philosophy today, as, as I will say again and again, um, and I, I will cover um, this part again in the conclusions part, in the conclusions, um, the relevance for our, our conversations, our philosophical conversations today, um, stay, comes from um, the Confucian, including the Japanese Confucian, very specifically Japanese Confucian, um, ideas of personhood and um, achieving knowledge and what exactly knowledge is and what exactly do we want uh, what do we want in life what do we have to strive for as human beings uh, what is moral discernment good for in in society and the world so um, in this um, in this sense Japanese Confucian thinkers like Soko, like Soko um, actually help a lot and add a lot to what uh, Roger Ames, who actually uh, focuses on Chinese Confucianism, is uh, very, very actively involved in at the moment, uh, finding an alternative to what he calls foundational individualism. And um, I will not explain the term here because I will cover this part in the conclusions. Um, but this is uh, what I feel um, my talk today can, uh, can help with in terms of intercultural philosophy. Um, I am sure I, um, I remember that Carlos also mentioned this in one of uh, his lectures in the series, um, how uh, Confucianism came to Japan, but uh, please allow me very briefly to um, review that. Um, Confucianism had a very, very long history in Japan. However, up until the Edo period, it was kind of a crippled type of legacy, if you will. Um, it didn't really catch on when classical Confucianism was introduced in the uh, fourth, sixth centuries. Um, 
those texts were in use by a very, very um, small category of people for very specific purposes, for official work and uh, for for training for um, public jobs, as it were. Um, and it didn't really catch on more than uh, being in Shotoku Taishi's constitution and um, spreading some very basic ideas of um, in uh, relational um, society. But later on, when uh, Neo-Confucianism started spreading in China, all of a sudden um, it had a lot more to offer to uh, Japanese intellectuals. And um, in medieval, when the, the, the date is rather uncertain for the second import, we know that it's sometime in the, in medieval Japan. We know that it was import. It was first brought by Zen Buddhists um, who were learning everything they could, um, and they were using these um, Confucian texts for uh, their, um, their 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 counsel to the daimyo, to the leaders, to, um, to the military leaders they were serving or they were in connection with. Um, however, as we approach the Edo period, um, there is a very um, sudden and complete break between Confucianism and Buddhism in the sense that towards the end of the Sengoku period, towards the beginning of the Edo period, um, there were, for example, Buddhist names, Buddhist monks only in name who would um, um, study Confucian texts and uh, really just be in the monasteries but not really uh, participate in the activities there, but they were more focused on these Confucian texts. So um, later on, um, Confucian, these Confucian scholars started uh, criticizing Buddhism and they saw that there was um, a core um, mismatch um, between the two. And um, it also helped a lot at the beginning of the Edo period that the Bakufu was trying to um, create um, a more stable society and um, they supported Confucian scholars because they came with these very, very important ideas of um, educating the public, educating people to better perform their social roles, for example. Um, and of course it was used uh, in, um, it had a political use. But on the other hand, when um, it was imported, when it, it started spreading in the Edo period, it also appealed to a very large part of the population. And um, one of the things I find most relevant for Confucianism in Edo Japan is not the orthodox school that um, supported the Bakufu policies and kind of created this idea of Confucianism being conservative and feudalistic in nature, but rather what it did with its focus on education, self-cultivation, on the fact that any human being, in order to be their best version of themselves, they had to cultivate themselves inwardly and outwardly um, to um, um, actually um, engage with, with society. And what it did was uh, basically democratize um, learning and philosophy because um, thanks in large part to Confucian scholars being so active and to the Bakufu support for Confucianism, um, schools spread all throughout the territory, the Japanese territory, you would have these uh, domain schools where um, sons and sometimes daughters of samurai would learn about Confucian classics and this kind of morality. But also at some point with the development of Chonin culture, um, the townspeople culture, um, you had the spread of private academies. Uh, with uh, the, the three uh, big cities that were developing throughout the Edo period, um, Edo, Osaka, um, even Nagoya, actually, um, you would have these scholars that would be 
supported by tuition fees from their students, which was quite um, quite um, interesting. Um, first of all, Edo society was becoming among the most uh, well-educated in the world at the time, as far as I know. Um, and a Confucian education had a, a huge role in that. So um, the fact that more and more people started coming, like more and more Bushi, members of the Bushi uh, social classes or the Chonin class started doing philosophy uh, was um, an incredibly important thing that happened thanks to this import of Confucianism in, um, in Japan. So um, when, when we talk about we, we generally have this uh, tendency when we talk about Edo philosophy, uh, while um, in all other, um, for all other periods, we tend to keep Buddhism at the center of intellectual debate. In the Edo period, Confucianism kind of topples that order and becomes the predominant um, intellectual current. And uh, why that happened, other than the political reasons, uh, was also probably because of the philosophical uh, you, the, the, the universe it, it envisioned. Um, I was telling you that um, early Confucians found this um, core break with Buddhism. Uh, their problem with Buddhism was that, um, you know, um, most of these sects that were appearing in Japan um, had very loose kind of morals, for example. Uh, they would engage in very extravagant um, behaviors. Um, they would be very, um, they considered them very uh, selfish and not really useful for society. And one reason why they were not useful for society other than extravagance and loose morals was also the, the the idea that you know you can escape this world of uh, suffering, whereas Confucians uh, were thinking like, okay, the, but why do you want to escape? Because you are a social being. We are. Uh, they, they were focusing on basic human sociality. We do not really. Um, and I'm borrowing the, the, the words of Rod, uh, Roger Ames now. Um, we, we are not really people who only exist in our own skin. Uh, but we we become who we are and we are who we are because and through the relationships that we have with the world around us and with people around us. So this idea that, you know, uh, you want to uh, escape human suffering um, by abandoning everything that makes you who you are was completely um, um, illogical. So... Um, I think this responded to a, a real need at the time in society. And then um, okay, um apologies, let me skip this slide. So um this was to just um conclude very briefly this part. This was what Confucianism brought to Edo society and especially Neo-Confucianism because it also dealt with certain topics that Buddhism dealt with um, and Taoism dealt with. It was a very open kind of philosophy at the time. Um, and it was very, very focused on the immediate world and immediate behavior. So uh, by focusing on society in a very fastly um, developing society at the time was uh, quintessential for, for its spread. And um, to, to give only a very brief overview of the major Japanese Neo-Confucian schools, again, I think Carlos already covered this part. So uh, all I want to do is um, try to explain why I chose the author I chose to talk about today. Um, you had this Shushigaku school, which was um, the orthodox school. Um, this was the one that the school, um, the Bakufu's official school. And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't so original in nature. It was very much in line with uh, Chinese Neo-Confucianism. And um, even if we talk about it, 
uh, we won't be able to say um, exactly what Japanese Confucian thinkers bring to the table. So um, I'm going to put um, the Shushigaku scholars, although they were incredibly important for the development of the philosophy in Japan, I'm going to put it aside. This was the initial stage. Um, this was happening, the Shushigaku uh, was happening um, starting with the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century um, with um, Fujiwara Seika, who was the first Buddhist priest that um, um, became uh, a Confucian scholar and broke with Buddhism, and Hayashi Razan, who was um, an advisor to the shoguns. So um, they had a very... Um, <clears throat> high position in, um, in Edo society. Um, the second one, um, the second important school is Yomei Gaku, um, represented, um, that started appearing um, in the early 17th century uh, with names such as Nakai Toju or Kumazawa Banzan. And from this point on, with uh, Yomei Gaku scholars and Kogaku scholars, I will talk about later, uh, we see how um, <clears throat> Confucian philosophy starts naturalizing, in a sense, starts responding to actual needs of Japanese society. So these philosophers start uh, breaking away with um, Juicy, with Shushigaku, with the Orthodox school, and um, try to bring uh, those teachings of the Confucians um, closer to actual real issues in Japanese society. Um, however, uh, while Yomegaku started breaking away, they were, um, there were differences from Shushigaku scholars, of course. Um, the most um, or the most original, in a sense, were um, scholars that we categorize today as belonging to the uh, Kogaku school. Um, again, these categories, like you probably heard again and again, these categories are um, basically rationalizations, uh, post-fact rationalizations. These um, philosophers did not really want to create a new school of thought. They, um, they just responded to the teachings and they were engaging in fierce debate sometime uh, over, um, over truth and the nature of knowledge and the nature of personhood and um, human, um, human existence. So uh, what the, the scholars we call today Kogaku scholars were the ones that um, had in common this idea of returning to the classics moving away from what Juicy had to say and all of those um, Buddhist elements or Taoist elements and going back to the classics, to what Confucius and uh, Mencius were saying, uh, because that's where the true knowledge uh, laid. So um, what they were saying that Shushigaku is just a perversion of those original teaching and there is no no value in, in, in doing um, that kind of um, <clears throat> scholarship, engaging in that kind of scholarship. So uh, what they also did was try to popularize Confucianism. They actively engaged in spreading these uh, Confucian teachings to uh, larger stretches of the population, uh, well beyond the Bushi population, for example, or well beyond the top layers of <clears throat> society. So um, again, if we are to look at these scholars, uh, for example, um, Yamaga Soko and Ogyu Sorai, because they're here um, in, in the pictures, um, they are very different from each other. So uh, for example, uh, one extremely, extremely important difference between Yamaga Soko and Ogyu Sorai is that while Yamaga Soko writes and used to teach Bushi mainly, his philosophy has a very, very clear universalistic aspect. Um, you can learn from his Shido, which is we would translate today as the way of the warrior, the way of the samurai. Um, um, but reading it, um, you realize how any kind of person belonging to any kind of social category could um, use that knowledge to become, um, yeah, the best version of themselves in no matter no matter in what role, 
Whereas Ogyo Sorai, for example, had a very specific, like a more hierarchical view of human nature. For example, um, he thought that you cannot really control um, who you're born to be and you can only become better within some limits. Whereas um, this limit is not so obvious in, uh, in Yamaga Soko's teachings. And while Ogyu Sorai was definitely the more influential in Edo society, um, his teachings were um, a lot more uh, popularized. Um, Yamaga Soko, Soko is, um, is more universal in nature. So I, I think that his, his writings even today are extremely, extremely um, um, wealthy in um, possibilities of learning. And here I move to the final part of the presentation, the philosophical perspective. Uh, I'm going to try and explain um, the idea of personhood and knowledge and moral discernment in the Confucian universe and specifically in Yamaga Soko's um, Shido. Um, and um, another, another reason why I chose Yamaga Soko is not only for the universalistic aspect of his teachings, but also because um, th this was the first attempt um, in, in Japanese Confucian uh, intellectual history uh, to adapt the Confucian nobleman to the social context, the political context of Japan, which meant that he was coming up with a sort of morality aimed at checking privilege in society. So the first fragment, the, the first thing he says when he starts his Shido um, is basically to put Bushi in their place by showing them that they are a privileged class because history made them so, uh, but they do not produce anything. They have to find another meaning for their lives. So um, they have to become uh, leaders. If we are to use today's vocabulary, uh, they have to learn uh, social and political leadership. And the way to do that is um, um, by looking at this model of the Confucian noble man. And this was extremely important because um, I, I feel this, is what, this would be something uh, that's relevant to uh, even politicians nowadays. I, I really hope some of them will, will read this work and um, see some of these things because what he does is um, basically uh, teach, of course, um, obligations, responsibilities, um, for all social roles, um, because he still works within the Confucian role ethics. Um, but he focuses much more on the responsibilities of the socially powerful, of the politically powerful. So more than um, the obligation uh, that hierarchical inferiors have towards their superiors, uh, he focuses on what the person in um, in a position of power has for, uh, for everything in the universe. So um, I, I felt it was rather uh, relevant to our discussion. So um, here um, I want to start with um, that um, idea that even Japanese Confucian uh, scholars, Japanese Confucian philosophy can offer uh, an alternative to uh, what Roger Ames called uh, foundational individualism. Um, if we look at how the human being is conceived of in uh, Confucianism, the main difference from let's what we call today Western style individualism, um, what Ames calls foundational individualism, is a matter of, of focus not on not on who you are, you the individual are, but rather on how you behave, on how you enact yourself um, in the relationships that uh, make up who you are. So basically, you are um, you are your relations with everything around you, with the nat natural world, with the universe. 
And because you're only a piece of the universe, um, you're also not really central in society. You as an individual, you, you are not. You enact, you become who you are by virtue of being in other relationships. So um, again, what, what Ames was saying, that you, you do not just exist in your skin. You have to, uh, there's no way to think about your life and yourself other than um, taking in consideration everything around you. So um, another important idea <laughs> that comes up in Confucian texts is uh, following the way. You have this, right, um, centrality of um, <clears throat> relationship, of a relational self. Um, and then you have the following the way. And a lot of times we tend to interpret following the way as um, <clears throat> abiding by a set of social norms, right? Uh, if, you play, if you play the part you're supposed to play in society, uh, you might be following the Confucian way. But um, Sokoi, Sokoi explains that um, that is actually not the case. Just enacting social norms is actually very superficial, insufficient, and to be avoided. Um, because the, the scope of a human life, um, what we all should strive for is um, something completely different. And um, I'm going to go back to this a little later, um, but I'm going to start with um, the human relationships we, we inhabit, we exist within. Um, and uh, please take this with a grain of salt. Uh, we are talking about an Edo period uh, Confucian scholar. Um, this is a criticism that is often brought to Confucianism that these five, five human relationships basically are uh, immodern in nature and completely incompatible with our modern lives, right? If you just look at the relationship between husband and wife and this idea of differentiation, you might get, I mean, this, this would be a definite trigger in, in any uh, normal conversation about relationships, I guess, or when we think about the relationship between elder and younger, having this idea of precedence. Um, so um, what, what I think Yamaga Soko does, um, unlike other Confucian thinkers, who definitely have a tendency, some of them have this tendency, and especially if you if you check popular texts, like let's say Onna Daigaku, which was a, a textbook for women, you definitely see these very um, strict social norms imposed on, on certain categories of people. However, uh, reading Yamaga Soko's Shido, um, you see that there is this clear sense that these are um, purely and coincidentally just the historical alternatives available to him at the time. That was the society he was um, active in. These were the, the principles that guided human life in, in that um, society. So um, I feel like this, um, this is not a set that is absolutely uh, unnegotiable for a human being. So uh, what, uh, what Shido uh, repeats again and again, what Yamaga Soko repeats again and again, is how um, humans have the power to, to negotiate these relationships they're in. Them being, for example, uh, a child in this relationship between parent and, parent and child doesn't mean that um, you have to obey your parents in everything they do and you have to be quiet and you just uh, have to uh, listen because they're older and they're your parents. Um, what Confucian philosophy puts at the center of this type of um, human connection is actually the principle that binds people together in both uh, like a, a very intricate web of uh, decisions which i think is extremely flexible and it is um, highly context based so um, in all the examples yamaga soko gives in shido um, this principle comes 
uh, forth again and again that, for example, um, okay, you have to be loyal to your lord, right? Because you are a bushi and because um, you have a job that you have to do because that lord pays your stipend. But um, his main concern is when he talks about loyalty, because this is one of the hot, uh, hot buttons of um, modern discourses. When he talks about loyalty of the vassal for the ruler, for the lord, he actually uh, makes it a point again and again to say that that loyalty is not pure obedience. Uh, just because he is your boss and your livelihood depends on them, you should never um, do mouth service, basically. You should never let them lead you and the community they serve astray. You have the right as, a, as part of that relationship, you have the right, for example, to overthrow a bad ruler because your concern should be like your uh, sincere affection and your sincere feelings for this um, ruler should um, actually be grounded in like the idea of loyalty one has to ground themselves in is thinking of the best for that person you have in front of you, for that person you interact with. And sometimes um, thinking of, um, of their good, you have to um, lead them back on the path. If they fail, you have to correct them. So it's actually a very, uh, a very kind of, uh, a very um, heavy responsibility. So when we think of loyalty, for example, in modern Japan, uh, in that Confucian sounding uh, loyalty of modern Japan, that is uh, miles and miles away from this idea that, you know, if you are a bad ruler, you do not deserve to be called a ruler. And this is very important, a very important principle in Confucianism that, you know, the content of relationships have, has to be um, the ideal of that relationship, the principle that binds two people in a type of relationship by a um, heavenly principle um, ha has to be what we strive for. So um, this is very, very different from the idea of this kind of social norm, right? Because he's your father, he's your boss, you have to listen to him. And if you are uh, presented with um, with the option to resist or uh, abide by what you're told, uh, you have to resist. That is your responsibility as a Confucian um, nobleman, as a Confucian person, as somebody who is uh, on a path of self-cultivation. So um, this is uh, very, uh, very important. Okay, and <clears throat> what about that path? Like, what does it mean to follow the way and live in accord with heavenly principle? What is with that principle that appears in every single aspect of human existence? And um, in what way and what for are we following the Confucian way? And <clears throat> because I was saying that those social norms are not enough, not desirable. Um, they exist, but they are only okay as long as they abide by heavenly principle. So um, what is the, the meaning of human life then? Um, and here <laughs> I made a very um, simplistic diagram of Soko's ideas of, um, of the path and what, what the meaning of human life is as he saw it or as I interpret it in, in, in his texts. So um, he does say that, um, to put it very, very simply, um, self-cultivation is basically the path to achieving freedom in like, becoming, a, becoming an agent in your own life and in the world, having the power to actually affect the world um, and doing good. So what he was saying is that, of course, you should, um, you should ground everything in uh, humaneness, right? The, the, the <clears throat> uppermost, um, uh, the most important value in, in the Confucian universe, humaneness and um, justness. Of course, that's good. You have to educate yourself to become, to always strive 
for being a humane person, to care about people around you and uh, about yourself and to do the best for everyone involved. But that's hardly enough. You cannot really, no matter how much effort you put into um, becoming better inwardly, as long as you do not uh, look outside you do not try to gain knowledge from what is going on in the world if you do not try to um, cultivate yourself intellectually learn geography learn history uh, learn um, um, astrology or whatever else is available to you as long as you don't do that you you cannot become free you are not in any way uh, capable of making moral like you cannot discern good from evil that's impossible so he had this double path of cult self-cultivation um being sincere in in what one feels and um what they felt their role is in um, in the world they inhabited but also investigating things. This is again a central um, concept in uh, Confucian, Neo-Confucian philosophy, the investigation of things. And what that means in very simple terms um, is um, basically using whatever knowledge is available around you to discover patterns in the universe, to discover those principles that guide everything, everything in the universe and our own lives, um, because the the more you learn, and not and not again, not scholarly achievement. So he doesn't mean scholarly achievement. Like he doesn't talk about uh, remembering facts, for example. For him, that's not learning at all. That is just um, uh, showing off, and that itself is a sin it's something not to do but actually striving to understand the patterns the way things change the way history changes um, because in that way you start seeing the same the principle that the principles that should guide your behavior um, and in that way you can make these principles you're trying to achieve in your own moral cultivation uh, accord with how um, the universe works, with the heavenly principle, basically. So uh, this is a very, very simplistic um, explanation of uh, the investigation of things and how he saw um, the achievement of this uh, moral um, discernment. But um, <laughs> to to make... Um, to go towards the concluding part of my presentation and to, to make a, a, a joke, um, I think this is a bit of an internal joke. In my university, um, we talk a lot to our students about critical thinking and the SDGs. Um, basically, we are um, the, the policy of the university is to make students um, gain agency in the world and strive for a better world, right? Being more aware of uh, ecological crises, uh, being aware of sustainable um, um, ways of engaging in all sorts of activities and having critical thinking. And we keep on repeating this again and again, and nobody really knows what it means among our students. Like how exactly do we achieve that critical thinking? Um, like, do we just not, not take anything for granted and question everything. And I think that in a very, very um, direct way, uh, what Yamaga Soko, uh, when Yamaga Soko talk, talks about moral discernment and how to achieve that, and um, when he talks about freedom in dealing with things, he, he talks about very, very specifically this kind of, uh, what we call today critical thinking. He, he talks about the fact that, um, like he's, as he says in this quote, the only quote that I'm giving you because um, we're running out of time. Um, okay, even if you refine your character, right, with humanity and justness, as long as you don't comprehend the qualities of things from astronomy to geography, the thousands of differences and myriads of distinctions that evolve from combination of positive and negative energies, then your way of dealing with affairs is not free. 
what is most important here, what he says is, you have not mastered heaven, earth, and society with your intelligence. Um, the way of like what we should strive for is actually by understanding things and also cultivating our our inner selves. Uh, we we can master heaven, um, earth, and society. We basically have by having understanding, we have power to, like I was saying earlier, to affect change in the world. If you become a leader, for example, uh, you can make sh like because you are aware of these things, because you're always learning, you can make better decisions for everyone um, that uh, who depends on you. So. Um, he makes um, this point again and again, especially for political leaders, right? Uh, he says, and he makes he makes the comment about the emperor. Th this is unthinkable for others, right? He says that even the august emperor in his unsurpassed rank must know about everything down to the work of lowly woodcutters, or there will be inevitably uh, there will inevitably be neglect in national government. So um, he is um, extremely aware of um, this kind of lack of virtue in, uh, in governance, in government, in, um, in Edo, Japan. So um, I feel um, this is the part where, um, where Japanese Confucian thinkers and especially Kogaku scholars and more and more specifically Yamaga Soko can, can be extremely relevant to um, a myriad of uh, philosophical um, debates we are having nowadays, starting from just the meaning of human life to the nature of knowledge or of learning and um, to the meaning of leadership in, in, if we go into corporate philosophy, if I can call it that. So um, just one more thought in conclusion, because I promised I'm going to talk about uh, Roger Ames' um, idea that Confucianism can, can actually um, move beyond this kind of foundational individual, uh, individualism that um, we kind of default to, especially in, uh, in Western debates on um, on personhood. And he says um, this kind of foundational individualism, which uh, he gives an example of in, in virtue ethics. So as, as we can see it in virtue ethics, um, has basically transitioned from a benign, uh, benign and liberating discourse to become what is, what is now a sometimes malevolent ideology uh, implicating, implicated in and aggravating many of the pressing ethical, social, and political problems of our time. Because and what, what the problem he sees in this kind of foundational individualism is that, okay, why, with this focus on who I am and the agency that I have and the things that I can do um, as a constant state, so see, like, because we, we have this kind of thinking, we limit the individual to uh, a specific state, right? We're kind of assuming that if you are righteous, you are righteous from, from birth to death. Whereas uh, he specifically says that, that that is not the case, right? We have different virtues, which we um, embody differently in different relationships that we have. And because this foundation individualism thinks and kind of simplifies things in, in such a way, it only creates benefits for a very limited number of people, for a few privileged. Whereas um, Confucianism, because it has this um, relational type of selfhood, of personhood, um, can actually help with the current predicament we're in. And uh, he most, I mean, he's most, um, his most uh, often uh, found example is capitalism and um, this idea of, uh, the ideas of justice that you know, the justice system still works um, on um, in, in the West. So um, what, what he says and what I also agree with uh, when it comes to Confucian personhood, uh, we have this idea, relational virtuosity, virtuo sorry, <laughs> um, uh, being virtuous in the relationships that uh, surround us and that we uh, inhabit. Um, basically, this is what makes our life story. 
and we shouldn't uh, take them as being separate but we are part because we are part of a universe right we have to have awareness of the nature that we inhabit um, the people that we engage with and that in all if we actually do Confucian role ethics right um, can um, show us um, like can help us create a better um, a better world um, with with more uh, good made for um, the most number of people so we can we can have leadership in in a sense we can have agency in in the contemporary world and um, this is a very short list of references. I only included the things that I, I talked about or I added on the slides. Um, I do, there are um, absolutely wonderful uh, books. Uh, this uh, Roger Ames's Human Becomings, Theorizing Persons for Confucian Role Ethics um, is absolutely wonderful to read. Uh, I do really recommend it. Okay, um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I hope I didn't almost went over time. Uh, Carlos, I cannot hear you. Yeah, yeah my mic was was off as usual. <laughs> These things happen. Well, no, thank you very much. It was it was a wonderful, wonderful talk, and we were right on time. We no problem with that. So, um, well, so far. Uh, there are some some people watching right now, and uh, there are two. Well, so Alvaro said Alvaro wanted to say that she's he's thankful for the for the talk. They are interesting. Um, Thank you. And well, um, we, remember uh, you um, para recordar a la audiencia tienen tienen espacio en el en el chat de YouTube pueden preguntar sobre cualquier aspecto de la de la charla o si quisieran que que que, que, que que si tienen alguna alguna duda sobre algún aspecto o quisieran profundizar en algún aspecto de lo que de lo que se habló hasta ahora well i i would, I would like to start um actually there are, there are a few things that that uh, turn well uh, there are many things i would i wish i could i could mention but well i have to choose and um, mm -hmm. One of one of the um, the things that um, well actually the, the the point where I'm going to 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 start is is uh, subjectivity precisely. Mm -hmm. There are lots of things that we have to 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 say about subjectivity today. And um, well, you said personhood. I know it's not the same thing. Not exactly. There are new important nuances, but. Uh, well, there there are reasons to choose that term in my case, but probably uh, it, it would be too much to 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 go into detail here. But uh, well, um, in a sense, I was I was interested, especially well in many things, but I will I will pick uh, pick up pick up on on this point. I understood it. Yamaga says Yamaga claims that in order to discern good from evil. We need to learn, well, to paraphrase it, we need to learn sciences in the, in the general sense of the term. We need to learn different sciences and disciplines. We need to use whatever knowledge is available to us so that we can discover patterns in the universe. And this discovery of patterns in the universe is fundamental to our discerning good from evil. And, well, it's interesting because it has not only ethical, but also political resonances, political echoes for us today. Um, but well, I have, I, I would start with a couple of questions. One has to do with, with the Buddhism, the other with the, with the, with the modern tradition, so to speak. Mm. And well, the one on Buddhism, uh, it deals with this, the, in, in a sense, there are some, some um, trends in, in traditional Buddhist thinking in, traditional Buddhist thought in Japan that would at first seem to, call, uh, to to clash with the idea of learning a lot of different disciplines. So someone as Dogen, for example, would uh, usually um, 
tell their, their his disciples they should not uh, waste time in non-Buddhist texts. That they <laughs> should focus on the way. Well, it, I think it's important to take that with a pinch of salt because he probably was addressing certain non-Buddhist texts. It's important to discern what he, he meant by that. And sometimes he claims, he even tells them, you should not um, engage in poetry or literature because that's a distraction. But then you see that Dogen displays a very, um, a very powerful um, poetic work. And even the, uh, a work like the Shobo Genzo, for example, in, in, in Dogen's case is, is full, it, it, it's, it's rich in, in images, poetic images, uh, some of the discourses in the Shobo Genso might be directly poems. Um, so, well, it is it is difficult for me to understand uh, this in, in the case of, of Buddhist philosophy in Japan, or Buddhist thought before modernity, because some places like Dogen, for example, since some, some certain words of Dogen's might lead us to think that he and other full, uh, Buddhist um, my teachers and philosophers in Japan might have uh, actually taken a long distance from this notion of learning several uh, uh, sciences. I'm probably wrong, I don't know, but uh, to what extent, and here goes my question, to what extent this, this point, learn several sciences and disciplines, was for um, Yamaga or for other Edo Confucian thinkers in Japan, a point of contention with uh, Buddhist scholarship or the Buddhist um, sphere? Um, I, I think it was um, central. I think it was part of their um, awareness that Buddhists don't really care about what's going on in the world, They like, in the social world, mm -hmm. right? They were living, especially uh, just as the Sengoku period was ending, uh, right, you had the first European contacts, then you had a lot of, you had Rangaku uh, developing in Edo, Japan. So knowledge was coming, trickling in from even the West. And um, it felt, it, it probably felt, although I, in the text I've read so far, uh, there weren't direct mentions of this. Uh, but it does feel like they were um, more open to understanding even a broader uh, kind of world, whereas uh, definitely yeah, it would have been a point of contention with, with Buddhists, that Buddhists were not learning. They were not interested in how the world worked to begin with because they wanted to escape it. Um, so this was definitely a central point of contention. Um, although I have to say I I have not focused so much on on these uh, specific points. It's definitely something that interests me, and um, I I will look into it. But um, I also think they have a point of contention with um, engaging in poetry and art, because again Confucians and in this case because we were talking about Soko he definitely has this he he tell, he basically tells his students to do whatever they can to actually uh, hone their skills because that again teaches them about you know how the body works for example right they he Yamaga Soko is also a military strategist so he was definitely interested in um <clears throat> in a body, in the workings of the body as a, as a tool. So as what you can learn from how the body works and the rites, the rituals of, um, of physical um, activities. Um, they were again, very, very um, open and encouraging of writing poetry because again, that was also a part of of learning and engaging with the with with society and with with how things worked mm. how things worked so they were very often apparently um i remember this is a part i learned i i started finding out when i started looking into women scholars female confucian scholars because it's basically impossible to find information about women confucian scholars i had to look towards literature like um 
We also um, talked a little bit about this with uh, Yusa Sensei a, a few weeks ago. So I actually did look into literature and the fact that um, Confucian scholars, together with women around them, uh, women that were part of their families, they were engaging in these very social events, writing poetry, uh, doing literature. So um, they were very, very active on that on that side also because it was uh, erudition. Mm. It was a form of erudition. But I think, um, I just, I don't know if it's necessarily related, but you made that comment about Dogen and you don't know how to understand the fact that um, he, um, he suggests uh, moving away from po poetry and art because it kind of takes you away from the path. I feel like there is definitely I don't want to generalize, but I do feel that when we read these old texts, um, there is there, um, um, I don't know about Buddhism, but in Confucianism, for example, I feel there is a break between theory and practice. Mm. The fact that um, a lot of a lot of people, right? I'm telling you about how Confucianism was so influential as an, ed as an education tool and how great it was for society. But then a lot of people would um, poke fun at Confucian scholars because they were kind of like grumpy old men <laughs> or like completely unaware of how society works and uh, especially the part of the demimonde and, you know, the more interesting uh, more lively aspect of society. So I definitely feel that although in theory, for example, they were supposed to engage in all these all these things that they could that could teach them to become better people, mm -hmm. um, they didn't always do that. And there were levels of um, and sometimes failures. And I think what Confucianism again, I, I'm not sure about Buddhism. But Confucian scholars, and especially Yamaga, um, accepts failure. Um, there is this idea that, you know, uh, following the way doesn't really mean that you never, ever uh, fail in, in following it. But following the way is you bringing yourself back um, to, to this. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I don't know if I answered your question. I hope I did. Well, it's um, and it, it's it's important. Uh, one of one of the intentions of my question is that it, it's important to to explore the points of contention in a philosophical tradition. Yeah. Because well, it happens to us. I I, I guess mm -hmm. it happens to you when you talk about pre-modern Japanese philosophy to a Western audience. The people tend to assume that it's all the same thing. Hmm. It happens to me a lot. It's even worse when I when I talk about Japanese philosophy. Sometimes people tell me uh, that's very interesting. I I really want to know more about Eastern philosophy. It's like it's even <laughs> broader. <laughs> like it was all the same thing. And well, still I I I, I guess there must have been responses in the Buddhist sphere to 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 these to these. Uh, types of criticism yeah I don't know anything about it or maybe mm -hmm. I want, maybe maybe the Buddhist sphere or Buddhist uh, scholars decided to remain silent on that during the Edo period which would, would be surprising but it would be very surprising <laughs> also, yeah I also don't know and I sometimes hear references I mean, I read references to uh, Buddhism, because because Confucians in the end, especially in the first part with Hayashi Razan, for example, mm -hmm. he did talk about Buddhism and those criticisms I got were, were from him. The fact that um, um, Buddhists are kind of uh, escaping the world mm -hmm. when they should be involved. Um, but later on, I don't think... I don't think there are so many questions because I feel as a tradition, it was quite separate. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the way in which learning was done in schools, in Confucian schools. Um, but yeah, I also did not find so many texts. Um, it would be very interesting to look at it. I think Roman might have some, <laughs> some pointers on this um, because um, um, 
Ando Shoeki is critical of every single tradition he mm. uses in his work. But um, yeah, I haven't found anything. Um, well, the, the other question has to do with, um, with um, modernity, especially the Enlightenment, uh, because, um, well, it, it, it's interesting to notice that, well, you, you, you read, inadvertently read some passages by Yamaga, and it, it, some people might, might think this, this, this guy looks like um, an Enlightenment thinker in Japan, accidentally born in Japan. Um, the question is what to make of this, because of course we run the risk of putting too much, of over-interpreting as it happened mm -hmm. to other authors. It happened, it happened to, the, to the historical Buddha that yeah, he was read as a, as a critical thinker trapped in the middle of a lot of superstition and mythology. Yeah. And that was too much. <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, it's interesting, I mean, to to recognize these points. It's they 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 have he has Yamaga seems to have an idea of education that is to, to a certain extent um close to the Enlightenment ideals. But at the same time, there is evidently, from what you said, a very evident point of contrast, their notion of individuality. For the Enlightenment thinkers, the individual was pri was was primordial, and in a sense, we can we can feel that in that direction, modern thought, especially in the nineteenth and tw in, in 20th centuries, um, evolved into considering that the more you split, and the more you sever your connections to the rest of reality, the more you become a real individual. Whereas, I mean, Yamaga would not accept would would not, not have accepted that at all. Not at all. It's interesting to explore. I mean, what can he tell us today, or more exactly, what can can he tell the modern tradition today, to that respect? I think, um, like like I was uh, mentioning when, when I talked about Ames, I, I feel like he's basically very much in line with other Confucian, neo-Confucian thinkers. Um, so as, as far as I've read about uh, Chinese neo-Confucianism, um, he definitely comes from the same area where uh, and th there isn't, I don't even like using the word individual uh, when, I, when I talk about um, Confucians, because I feel like it kind of brings in this um, this centrality of who we are as separate from. But um, I, I think the main, the still the central point of um, Confucian um, personhood is the fact that um, there is absolutely no knowledge you can gain and no um, no actual um, understanding of the world if you separate yourself from it. I, I think this is again very similar to what you were saying in one of your talks about um, learning through experience. You cannot really learn unless you are engaged in, in, in the activity you're trying to explain. I, I think you were, you were talking about a Buddhist um, text um, at uh, the time. And um, I feel it's the same kind of place and the same kind of lesson that he would give us that um, we, we do not, we are not separate in any way. We just, uh, our human existence is just one, one pattern and one um, embodiment that appeared from, you know, the works of, uh, of heavenly principle and material force. So when these two, when these met, they gave birth to, I mean, they, they created everything in the universe and the, the person is just one. So there's nothing that we can ever gain from separating ourselves from, from that. Um, yeah, I, I think this is, this is the, the main lesson he would, um, he would give us. Um, 
in this sense, I don't feel, I don't feel that his conceptualization of personhood, of being human, because I cannot, um, I mean, I'm, and I'm using the word personhood because I have to deal with it in some way, but he doesn't even talk about that. He doesn't only uses his very specific terms when he talks about uh, moral discernment, for example. He talks about daijobu, about the uh, the nobleman. So he has some categories of people. So he has steps you need to strive for in your moral, in your self-cultivation process. Um, he doesn't even talk about personhood, about something. This is just um, my, uh, my interpretation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that would be his lesson. You're not in any way special. So get down from your high horse and look around and understand how all things work. And you'll also understand how you work. And yeah. And then you can try making changes. Yeah. There, there's, we, that, that, that especially connects to what you were trying to articulate at the end. Yeah. There's a long discussion to have. Now, one, one of, I'm, I'm very, very... Um, I mean, I'm thinking uh, in, in, in for a few years, I've been thinking about these issues also from a Buddhist perspective. But I think that definitely the, 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 the Confucian tradition has a lot to say. I, I would, well, I would, would, like, would like to, to comment a little bit more on that. But before that, and depending on our time availability, we'll see. But before that, there's a question from the audience, Carla would like to know whether uh, Edo philosophy had anything to do with the end of the shogunate. I mean, yes. <laughs> um, in many ways, because um, if you... Um, this is a very difficult question. I would I would say yes, and I would say that uh, Maruyama Masao uh, did a very good job of explaining um, explaining that uh, a little bit. I cannot do it justice, definitely. Um, but of course, Confucian philosophy was informing uh, much of um, the new powers that were being created, the, the ones that rebelled against the shogunate. Um, <clears throat> Son no Joy is a movement that was uh, very closely related to the figure of Yoshida Shoin, for example. So Yoshida Shoin actually uh, was one of the disciples of Yamagasoko. He was an admirer of Yamagasoko. At some point, I think he went on a <clears throat> he went on a pilgrimage, um, following in his footsteps. Um, and Yoshida Shoin, who was drawing a lot from, from Yamaga Soko, but who was also influenced by that movement of Son no Joy, of trying to repel the barbarians, keep, keep the Westerners out and um, overthrow the shogunate. Um, <clears throat> and among, his, among Yoshida Shoin's disciples, you had huge names in the Meiji government, like Ito Hirobumi, the, the prime minister. Um, who also drafted the first constitution. So that was a direct connection, if you will, uh, to, to Confucianism in, in that sense. Um, I think Confucianism in a less direct way um, affected the way people thought about history. The fact that Mitogaku um, appeared, the fact that even Kokugaku, even uh, native studies uh, scholars who were so focused on finding that original Japanese spirit <clears throat> were inspired by what Confucians were saying, right? Confucians were saying again and again that we have to study history. We have to look at the history of this place. So Kokugaku scholars did just that. Um, it moved away from Confucianism in the process and kind of uh, considered it um, <clears throat> a foreign <clears throat> import that needs to be discarded. But then the methodology and the philosophy of that was still at the base of what they were trying to do. So um, in many ways, yes, it was connected to the fall of the shogunate. Yeah. It, it was a force, of, a revolutionary... <laughs> It, it was, yeah, 
influencing it was influencing the that revolutionary kind of spirit going on like was it yoshida shoin yes yoshida like, shoin Yoshida Shoin. Okay, an intellectual living at the by the end of the Edo period. He actually, <laughs> uh, this was uh, one of uh, one episode about Yoshida Shoin that um, shows you he he had this idea that you know he wanted to repel the barbarians. He wanted uh, the the emperor to take power again. But also he felt like, you know, because these foreigners are trying to come in and um, break open our, our gates, he felt like the first thing that they should do is learn from them, right? You have to learn the technology they have. Like they came here by boats, for example. They have definitely superior um, technology available. So he actually tried to escape and he tried to get on... Um, um, on the barbarian ships and he was arrested and he died in prison so yeah interesting because it seems that that his his um i mean his link to to yamaga's thought would have influenced his attitude toward a western science and technology yes. we should, he, he, would, he would have said we should repel the barbarians but we should learn their arts yeah. So, mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, even I have to say this that even Yamaga Soko had a bit of a proto nationalistic streak to his thought. Mm -hmm. um, so he had another work uh, where he. Um, where he actually tried saying that, you know, that central earth, the, the central uh, territory, right? It, chu, chu, uh, chu, goku no chu. Uh, that middle earth, uh, the center of the universe, it's not China, it's Japan. So um, he also had this, um, there was definitely a streak there, but I, I, I cannot call it nationalist. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a it's form of early, Early historical awareness, I would call it. Okay. Awareness that they have to kind of reclaim the centrality of the world for, for their own. Like that, that was the world they inhabited, right? When Yamaga Soko was activating, he, there was no idea that, you know, the world is such a big place that has to um, collaborate. So. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, um, going back uh quickly to to my initial questions especially about about uh, modernity um well some people might claim that despite uh, despite despite its uh, its um troublesome nature individualism in the west has also been important for the um con constitution of certain values that many societies would not give up today uh, the centrality of the individual has been important to the, um, for example, the the notion of human rights, of human dignity that many, many um, democracies defend today. Still, it is recognizable that it also has its problems, especially when we, when we see certain problems, environmental problems, immigration problems, problems of identity, a lot of things like that. Uh, they can be traced back to this exacerbation of the individual in modernity. Um, yes, well, at the same time, we could not like throw away the whole thing. Definitely. Um, and to be honest, um, I want. I don't have an answer. I don't. I don't have an answer for this. And um, to to be perfectly honest, even when I think about this concept of you know confucian personhood because i cannot i don't know how to call it otherwise uh i don't really think that we would have escaped a lot of the issues that we still have i mean okay i i feel like confucian philosophy is to a certain extent uh compatible with ideas of human rights and activism for example because it has that seed, you know, the fact that uh, when a ruler, where somebody superior to you does not do their job honestly, sincerely, with your best interest at heart, then you should topple them. You have the right to topple them. Mm -hmm. 
while it has that kind of revolutionary seed, I mean, if we look at uh, societies where Confucianism has been influential, the fact that it has been ideologically manipulated so many times in so many different ways does tell us that there are some inherent weaknesses there. Maybe we're not getting them quite right, uh, but I don't think I don't think they could have saved us from from the fact that yeah from from from, from the evils of well, from the ills of modernity, modern life. I. I feel it's compatible, but again, I would only add it to what already exists. Just like you were saying, I would not take back everything that that um, <clears throat> raw individualism um, had to offer to the world. I would just add to that. I would. I, I don't think a destruction and reconstruction is a solution anyway for anything that um, can be good. I mean. Uh, that, that, that can create change in the world. We, we have to do it by picking up the pieces that we can keep and then adding on top of it. Um, yeah, I don't think Confucianism in itself would have, would have enough strength to bring about human rights, for example, or make that issue better. Because Confucian scholars, again and again, we, we probably go back to the same thing, right? When we talk about philosophy turning into ideology, and kind of having this malevolent streak to whatever philosophy we, we engage with, like Western philosophy, like this idea of agency and individualism, that, that, is, that is there in any kind of tradition as long as we have um, people who can have the freedom to interpret texts differently, as long as we have people who understand it better than others. The majority of us are not always putting in the effort to understand the principles so well, right? Just like popular Confucianism was a very simplified form of this. That's why Confucianism in real life, in real society, was actually linked to the fact that uh, women had historically a bad position in society. It was not just Confucianism. It was also Buddhism to a large extent. It was also Shinto. But still... It was there, and it was um, creating havoc in real life, and people did not really understand the, the depths of it. So I, I don't. Yeah. There's, there is room for conversation. It seems, as you explained, there are seeds of, of there, there are seeds in Confucian think in, in our case, Japanese Confucian thought that would allow for. Um, contributions of Confucian thought to, to democracy, for example. On the other hand, there is something that a, a colleague of mine, a, 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 a specialist in, 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 in modern philosophy, one Francisco Manrique, he, he mentioned once that, uh, well, the French Revolution had three values, um, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And many, mm -hmm. many thinkers during the French Revolution, um, especially uh, focused on equality and liberty, but not in fraternity, because they took for granted that as long as humans are free and equal, they will they will be fraternal to each other. And it seems they were wrong. Yeah, <laughs> it was wrong that they took it for granted, but precisely because of its focus on uh, relations and trust in human relations, Confucian thought has a lot to do, ha has a lot to say in that area. There is well talking about the other the other side. There is there is I remember a, um, an article called "Religion, Democracy, and the Twin Tolerations." I have it here on my screen right now, written by Alfred Stepan Stepan in two thousand in the year two thousand. He mentions a case. I think it occurred in the nineties. By then, Huntington was talking about uh, the clash of civilizations and um, Singapore's prime minister. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew at some point um, tried to justify uh, uh, a certain uh, some uh, the somehow authoritarian regime in Singapore, um, resorting to what he called Asian values, and was he was specifically talking about Confucian values. But uh, straight ahead, he was challenged by two democratic leaders in the Asian sphere. Um, then 
uh, Korea, South Korean President Kim Da Jong and Taiwan's President Lee Tang Hui both declared that Confucianism, but they could construct a democratic society based on Confucian values. Therefore, what then uh, Singapore's leader Lee Kuan Yew was trying to do was to justify authoritarianism um, in an abusive way. I mean, he was abusing Confucian value. Um, so it's an example, I think, that this kind of, of, of conversation is possible and, and probably very necessary today. I think so, yes. Oh, uh, can, I, can I please have the title of that article oh, after? Yeah. after we I have a copy, so I can send it to you. Okay, thank you. It's uh, Religion, Democracy, and the Twin Tolerations. And, uh, well, there's, there's one more question in the chat. Um, well... Probably too. So Alvaro would like to know which books you would recommend from uh, for which books you would recommend for uh, um, learning more about Edo philosophy. Well, <laughs> other than the source book that I think we all talk about a lot nowadays, um, Isaac Casulis and. Mm -hmm. Uh, Maraldo, and maybe Brett Davis's um, handbook of um, Japanese philosophy, um, specifically about um, Edo philosophy. Um, yeah, I I do I do think that Maruyama Masao is still mm -hmm. is still one of the best books available. Uh, although it has some issues um, that um, can be discussed, but available in English at least, I, I'm not aware of a better book than that. Um, I don't? Hmm? Uh, Mariano, oh, I think it's studies in uh, Japanese intellectual history. Give me one second, I'll check it now. I'm not sure about the, um, the English title. Studies in the intellectual history of Tokugawa, Japan. Okay, Princeton. Okay, thank you. I mean, I would also recommend the Watsuji Tetsuro book, but that is not uh, translated in English. Maybe it's a project for the future. Um, he has a he has a beautiful um, six volume um, book on the history of ethical thinking in Japan. Mm -hmm. But it's not translated yet. It's not. It is not. Well, <laughs> yeah, Mario Masa it is, and more specifically for Confucianism. Um, but that was not the. That was not the question, right? Not Confucianism. Um, I have um, a Confucianism in in Edo culture, I think. A Confucianism in Togoga culture. Just give me one second. Yes, Confucianism and Tokugawa culture, um, published again in 1984. Um, is a wonderful um, book by Peter Nosko, um, edited by P Peter Nosko, um, that I would recommend. Great. Well, uh, one one question, one more question in the chat. Uh, someone, well, this is this was uh, written in English. Uh, the achievement of sustainable peace, coexistence, and power over time from the management of centralization and at the same time federalism with the notorious invisibility of the individual. I think this was part of a longer comment, but well, anyway, the question is how can, how can it be related to existing systems today? I wonder, I wonder Patty is, is, is asking about the achievement of, of things like sustainable peace, new existence, um, how can all that be related to existing systems today? I'm not sure if that's, but in the sense of that exactly the question. Yeah, 
did you did you get did you get it or i oh i was waiting i thought you were um you're getting um, right, uh, um hmm. but also i was taking the time to think about it because i don't i don't think i have an answer to that i'm that's a that's a bigger project than um than i can even comprehend uh, probably i mean as long as if i understood this correctly is in, in in what way can confucianism add value to the existing systems or um how it can modify them to achieve these uh, goals of um equality and i whereas for example roger ames again and again and roger ames and rosemont um they have been uh, consistently trying to come up with models for confucian a uh, confucian rethinking of western models of capitalism like uh and for, he, he, they, they are saying that um, capitalism can be made more humane mm. by the incorporation of Confucian um, elements and by looking, for example, at meritocracy. I mean, Confucians are uh, by essence meritocratic. Um, and it, but it's a meritocracy that is also humane. Uh, it never, ever, ever leaves aside the idea of humaneness, the fact that it has to be mutual and it has to not um, if, afflict pain, mm -hmm. right? It, it is not the kind of meritocracy that just um, defines itself by sheer competition, like uh, cruel competition. Um, but it can also be, I don't know, at some point if you're competing with somebody and you feel like they they actually lack the power to gain. I, this is my own interpretation. <laughs> I, I, I might be wrong, but for example, um, if we are competing for a job, right? Um, and at some point I, I realize that um, you might be, might just be uh, better suited for a particular place. Um, you can easily withdraw uh, or you can easily um, help the other achieve what they're supposed to achieve mm -hmm. because in the end uh, because we are um right being in accord with that heavenly principle means that we are we're doing our best for the world for e everyone so i i'm just i don't have that much of an ego in confucianism right i shouldn't have that much of an ego that tells me that you know this is a competition i'll win it no matter what so i think that this is what uh, Ames and Rosemond, for example, mean when they say that um, capitalism, for example, can have a more humane face because of Confucian principles. How much of that is doable, realistically speaking, um, given that we also learn history and we try and we see patterns, <laughs> um, remains to be debated. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think, again, it's, it's a matter of just being a little idealistic and always um, forget how we tend to manipulate and abuse any kind of um, this kind of idealistic um, system of thought that we we use individualism yeah it, it it wasn't such a bad thing when it appeared and for the most of um, modern early modern history but yeah. it, it by nature of how things change and evolve um, it's, it also has these, um, what, what am I, I'm looking for a word, um, distort, distorted um, interpretations. It will happen with Confucianism anyway, also cannot be, uh, I'm sorry to be so dark, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't, um, there's no ideal way to do that to modify the systems we have, even with Confucian uh, principles. We always have to be aware and always kind of keep balance. And this is, again, a, a, a Confucian, a, an idea often met that you cannot take any kind of knowledge you have for granted. 
that introspection and analysis and trying to understand that process is continuous because the moment you stop that moment is the moment when knowledge disappears mm -hmm. uh, you're distorting it already if you're not continuously involved in this process of self-cultivation and awareness at least that's my um, that my those are my two pennies well, it seems that from what you say, whatever in whatever case, mm, con the Confucian tradition should not be taken as a as a miraculous solution to anything. Absolutely not. It, it rather warns us against miraculous solutions. It's, nothing replaces our efforts or strive to or struggle to become better individuals. Mm, yes. Mm. Well, I think that's, that's new. <laughs> Thank you. That's very well put. Thank you. <laughs> I think that's a very good contribution. I think from your part because because I think that precisely what what uh, modern individualism tends to 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 set apart is the need for self cultivation. Seems like all I need is to be granted the conditions to be the individual I am, and the rest will will somehow um, arrange itself. And that's not. Yeah. That's yeah. not, that's definitely not the case. Yeah. Nature will adapt, right? I need to take my shower every day with 60 exactly. liters of water. So nature can just. Exactly. Well, um, I definitely will um, write to you later. I need to. I'm looking forward to it. More, I hope. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm also, I mean, very, very concerned about issues like this and I mean, I, I tend to articulate my ideas in terms of subjectivity instead of personhood. We, we I, would, I would love to talk about that a bit. I'm not, I'm not 100 percent convinced of my own perspective, but uh, well, I already started, so I need to. I'm also not convinced. I cannot afford to be convinced of my own perspective. I still have to investigate things. Mm. Yeah, it's relevant. So, well, um, by now I'll switch to 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 Spanish and wild to, to close the event. But um, so you can say here yet. So um, we can have some final words, I think, after after the, the, the recording is stopped. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank it's, you. I'm really gl glad. Thank you for all the questions. I, I really have a lot to think about now. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And so, well, I'm, I'm now switching to Spanish. Eh, muy bien, muchísimo. Ahora es, es el momento precisamente de, de, de cerrar el evento. Por ahora nos vamos. Pero bueno, ha sido un, una, una exploración muy interesante porque nosotros queríamos un tipo de equilibrio muy difícil de conseguir con un evento como este. No queríamos una exploración que le permitiera a un público amplio y que le permita ahora y en el futuro a un público amplio en América Latina eh, explorar, entender, conocer por primera vez la filosofía japonesa, una primera exposición, pero al tiempo queríamos lugares que nos permitieran reflexionar profundamente en alguna medida creo que eso lo alcanzamos, con todo y las dificultades que eso pueda significar, esa es nuestra idea precisamente eh, servir como panorama y en ese sentido agradecemos precisamente a aquellas personas en la audiencia que a lo largo de estas nueve charlas eh, han estado preguntando precisamente de acerca de esas cuestiones básicas. Básicas no quiere decir que sean menores. Básicas quiere decir que son la base y precisamente hemos tenido preguntas algunas sobre eso, ¿no? Conceptos fundamentales, eh, cuestiones... Eh, sobre como también como bibliografía básica que se pueda leer para explorar más. Se trata de eso y por eso agradezco muchísimo ese, 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 ese orden de preguntas, que siempre es muy importante hacer y porque a veces la gente no las hace pensando en, en esto de, bueno, no, son preguntas como muy básicas, eh, mejor no las hago y en realidad lo importante es que son eso, la base. Y en todo caso los comentarios, sus comentarios también, sus reflexiones, eh, sus, eh, sus, sus aproximaciones críticas también que ha habido desde YouTube han sido muy importantes. Eh, 
Eso y esperamos precisamente que no solamente con esto podamos alimentar la, la filosofía eh, académica y que eventualmente eso, la filosofía japonesa, entre más y se vea más en las universidades en América Latina, que es una idea que nos interesa muchísimo, sino que también podamos eh, de esta forma, y, y, y estoy convencido de que sí, podamos a, alimentando más nuestro, digámoslo así, nuestro, nuestra nuestra caja de herramientas filosófica con otras tradiciones distintas de, de, de lo que solemos ver en las universidades, a través de eso podamos eh, tener más, eh, poder con mayor contundencia mostrar a la sociedad que la filosofía es un ejercicio relevante para nosotros hoy. Esas son nuestras, nuestras intenciones y, y esperamos seguir aquí apoyando eso, la libertad de pensamiento, el ejercicio crítico, y la conversación entre distintas tradiciones. Eh, bueno, sin más, lo último que vamos a tener es un pequeño video de cierre. Eh, entonces, por favor, no se vayan, esperen al video de cierre. Eso será lo último que tengamos en el evento. Y, por supuesto, las grabaciones eh, de todo el evento las podrán seguir viendo y compartiendo. Estarán disponibles en una lista en el canal de Revista Horizonte Independiente. Muchísimas gracias a todas nuestras, a todos nuestros eh, conferencistas y a nuestro público por, por seguirnos. Muchas gracias y nos seguiremos viendo. Llega la hora de ratificar la importancia de las humanidades en el derecho ante la filosofía. Es en la riqueza de la exploración de la diversidad filosófica donde la apertura se genera. No es mostrar la importancia filosófica eh, con más de lo mismo, ya que no abunda y en muchas ocasiones no es muy bien recibida, sino mostrar los conocimientos, los diferentes criterios de racionalidad, la multiplicidad de enfoques. Es mostrar los contenidos de la filosofía todo lo que el vasto mundo puede ofrecer. En aquel entonces y todavía hoy, Dos años después, en las instituciones donde habitualmente se enseña y se investiga sobre filosofía, la tendencia es que predomine de manera a veces casi exclusiva la filosofía de tradición occidental y eso a pesar de que cada vez crece más el interés entre los estudiantes por otras tradiciones de pensamiento. La filosofía será global o no será. Y esto en el siguiente sentido, si tiene alguna expectativa razonable de mostrar su relevancia para distintos ámbitos y para distintas necesidades de las sociedades y de nuestros tiempos, la filosofía tendrá que ser realmente representativa de la diversidad de culturas del mundo y eso incluye la diversidad de tradiciones filosóficas del mundo. Eso implicará también ir más allá del canon que habitualmente se enseña en la filosofía académica, es decir, en la filosofía en las universidades.